Welcome back if you have joined us for previous sessions and welcome to the series of Difficile First. I'm Zara and I am the co-founder of 100SOM and co-organizer for Research Insider and I will be your host for today. So without further ado, today we have Kai Xiang who is a PhD student at the Social Genetics and Developmental Psychiatry Research at King's College London. He investigates the underlying causes of self-harm behaviours and their relationship with mental health conditions. And over to you, Kai Xiang. Okay. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, hello, everyone. Okay. Um, thank you for coming um, to the session today. And, um, and thank you for being interested in, in um, this session. So the outline of my talk today will be um, separated into five parts. So firstly, I'm going to talk about my education timeline and then some brief talks some brief introduction to my research field um, and then I, I will introduce the idea of um, mental health jar. Uh, after that I'll talk about more about my research and then I'll wrap it up with um, what I do um, as a PhD student in my daily life. All right. Um, so these are the last six years of my life in a slide. Um, in, so I, I came with a background of psychology uh, undergraduate psychology from University College London and um, when I was doing my undergraduate I came across this subfield in psychology called behavior genetics which is studying um, the genetic influence on um, human behavior and that led me to do a master's at King's College London um, it's called um, MSc in Genes, Environment, and Development in Psychology and Psychiatry. And it seems like as the time goes on, the name of my title just become longer and longer. So after I finished my master's, I stayed in the same research department to do my current PhD, which is um, PhD in Social Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry Research. All right. Um, it may seem like... Um, my life seemed like a straight line, but actually wasn't that case. Um, so when I was doing my A-levels, I actually thought of doing medicine. Um, and then I still realized that maybe it's not for me. Uh, I also thought about doing an undergraduate in maybe biology or um, biochemistry because I was quite interested in genetics back then. Uh, but I was also interested in human mind uh, and that led me to do an uh, undergraduate in psychology. And once I entered the BSc psychology course, just like many other undergraduate psychology students, um, I thought of becoming a clinical psychologist, um, but that, that did not happen. <laughs> um, and then I thought, well, um, maybe after this MSc course, I can go back um, and you know think about becoming a clinical psychologist again. Um, but after, but um, you know, as I advance in the course I realized that I was more I was sort of still quite interested in um, behavior genetics um, and then I end up doing a PhD um, which is kind of like my current shoes now so um, the purpose I'm putting this out here is is sort of like because I know there are some high school students um, in, in this session um, and I just want to let you know that back then I was also quite confused of what should I do with my life. Um, so I guess the take home message is um, try not to be too panicked about your future because most of the time what you plan end up not working. Um, I, I wanted to become, I wanted to go into medicine, I wanted to do like an undergraduate and biology related courses or even becoming a clinical psychologist, but all this sort of plans and dreams and ideas um, they didn't really work and then as time goes on I realized you know interests develop and then you sort of change as a person as well so I guess um, just stay curious stay open-minded um, try a range of different things and um, hopefully you end up with something you like to do all right so now let's move a bit more into my research field um, I'm based in this center. So basically, my PhD is the name of my center. It's called Social Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry Center. Um, we like to call it 
in acronym, acronym SGDP, so I call it SGDP Center from now on. Um, it is a vibrant international research community um, and it's a very diverse research community as well. People come from different fields. Um, so there will be like statistical geneticists um, and some people study psychiatry more in like the social perspective and some study psychiatry in more developmental perspective. And they can, because we're based in the same building, we can sort of um, talk to each other more easily and then um, work with each other to, to tackle a particular research question from multiple perspectives. So um, my PhD is sort of being based in the center um, and in so, I mean, so far, um, I have to rely on like knowledge and skills from different fields. So my background in psychology is helping me to understand more psychiatry. Um, I have learned statistical genetics and, uh, and some form of bioinformatics as well for my research. So this different fields come together and this stuff more and become a hybrid of my PhD. So this is how my research field is like. And now I'm going to talk about the mental health jar. Um, so because we're trying to tackle uh, mental health conditions from a more sort of comprehensive perspective, so we're looking at what is, you know, like when studying what underlying causes for mental health conditions, and uh, we often talk about like, oh, there are genetic factors, environmental factors, but people often struggle to understand um, how to put this both things into perspective, nature versus nurture. So I want to give credits to Professor Janai Austin, who is a genetic counselor. Um, and she also specializes in research in psychiatry genomics. So she came out with this um, idea or analogy of mental health jar to put um, how genetic risk and environmental risk come together um, in uh, a mental health episode. So imagine there is an empty jar called a mental health jar. And in order for a person, so everyone has a mental health jar, and in order for a person to develop a mental health condition, um, the jar has to be full. So in order to fill in a jar, there are two different things that we can fill in. So there are environmental factors. Um, think of um, these risk factors like um, coming from a disadvantaged background, um, losing a loved one in your life at some point of time, or even a like what we're living in now, a coronavirus outbreak. Um, and we also have genetic factors that can be filled into the jar. Um, I think one, one good thing about this mental health jar is that um, it's not like a huge chunk of um, um, orange triangles or yellow um, circles. They are, they, they come in like relatively smaller size that, you know, um, so I guess this bringing the idea of genetic risk is not just of um, either you have the genetic risk or you don't have the genetic risk, but it's more like in, a, you can see in a more like a quantitative way, sort of like a continuum. Um, some people have high genetic risk, some people have moderate genetic risk, some people have low genetic risk, um, and um, it can be sort of, sort of come in an additive way. Um, some, so it's, it's not just governed by just one or two genes or them. Um, it, it's, it's being influenced by um, multiple, what we call it polygenic traits of so multiple genetic um, variants of multiple genes that come into the context. All right. Um, here. So, as, so when a person is born, the person come with like a certain level of genetic predisposition for the mental health condition. So in this mental health jar, I can see a person with low genetic risk, but as time goes on, um, the person experiences a lot of envir environmental risk and eventually the jar is full, which means the person eventually develop a mental health condition. Um, and when we look at the next situation, a person um, born with higher genetic predisposition and low environmental risk, and as time goes on, the jar becomes full as well. So it, it doesn't matter whether a person is 
is born with low or high genetic risk. Um, the environment matters as well in making the jar full. So you might think, well, now the jar is full and a person is, is experiencing mental, uh, mental health condition. Does that mean that's the end? Is that nothing else we can do? Um, so the idea is that as, as long as the jar is full, the person will be experiencing mental health condition. So in order for to make the jar to be not full, we can remove the environmental risk factors. Um, so for example, being in a stressful environment for work, you take that, um, that environment away, take a risk factor away, then um, the jar become less full. Um, another way to, to make the jar not full is to add in more protective factors, like all these rings that can be added to the jar. Um, when the jar is full and then you add the rings, the volume of the jar increase and it's not full anymore. Um, so these protective factors can be think, you can think of them like um, social support, like um, taking um, medication or um, having enough sleep, self-care, um, support from friends and family, and so on. So when, so it's, it's not something that's fixed. Um, I, I guess that's the idea. Um, the environmental risk can be removed and we can add a more protective risk um, to, um, to, so that a person will not develop mental health condition. All right, um, and now I'm going to talk more about um, my research. Um, I guess when I, when I started my PhD, um, when my, my supervisor told me, it's like, oh yeah, let's, let's look into self-harm. I thought, yeah, self-harm, that sounds really interesting. And then when I started reading the research, I realized that there are many different terminologies to sometimes for, you know, sometimes they're used to um, define similar behaviors, but sometimes these similar behaviors can also have very subtle differences. And these terminologies can be can be used differently from countries to countries. So, for example, um, the term self harm can mean differently in the U.S. and also in the U.K. Um, and there are also terms like non suicidal self injury, which is more popular in the U.S. and non suicidal self harm that's more popular in the U.K. Um, even though I can, I also see some U.K. Um, U.K. based researchers use use the term non suicidal self injury and also deliberate self harm, um, and like from first glance, you might think that they they seem to be describing similar um, action or similar behavior, but um, you really have to scrutinize the introduction section of a paper to to really know what it really means. Um, and and um, in the past, if you if you read um, papers from maybe ten years ago. Um, terms like Paris suicide and deliberate self harm are more um, popular as well, but um, because they, they can be quite stigmatizing um, or um, they sometimes fail to even capture what it really means. So mm, nowadays, um, more, I would say, like more recent research, I can see self harm, non suicidal self injury attempted suicide, suicidality. And then, and then there are also like um, this part of the um, terminologies that, that are being used as well, but um, because that is more at the suicide, 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 um, suicidal intention kind of um, um, area rather than like looking to the self-harm or uh, the non-suicidal self-harm part. So yeah, that, is, that was quite frustrating. Um, but in doing a research, I have to sort of rely on a definition. So um, the definition that I'm using for self-harm in my PhD research is a definition given by the NICE guidelines. So NICE is um, the national clinical guideline given by the UK um, in, um, for, 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 for health professionals. So um, NICE define self-harm as any act of self-injury or self-poisoning carried out by an individual, regardless of intention or motivation. So um, 
this can include um, self-harm self -harm for non-suicidal reasons and also um, self-harm for suicidal reasons. Um, and there is this popular saying that um, self-harm is not suicide attempt. That's right, because self-harm is such an umbrella term. Um, so, and also in the US, self-harm is more used to define the non-suicidal um, perspective as well. But I guess um, the reason why um, the researchers are using such a broad definition as an umbrella term is because it's really hard to um, define one's motivation in self-harming because it, it can be very it's very because self-harm itself is a very complex behavior and everyone's story is unique um, so it's really hard to um, pinpoint why a person self-harms so but um for my PhD, I'm side dividing it into non-suicidal self-harm and suicidal self-harm. And the aim of the PhD is to see um, whether suicidal and non-suicidal self-harm are caused by different factors using genetically informative designs. So that it can tell me to what extent uh, the genetic risk is playing a role. Um, I think it's also important to note that from my own personal observation, um, this this acronym is non-suicidal self-harm and suicidal self-harm. I don't think um, they're being used very widely. Um, so I, I would say these terms are used more for like research purposes. You, you, you probably see them more often in research papers rather than um, like mental health resources or, or like a mental health website. Um, so what are the non-suicidal reasons for self-harm? Um, there is a paper by Emerson et al. in the Journal of Affective Disorders. Um, it's a systematic review looking into um, a series of interview studies, um, interviewing people who have self-harm and asking them what are the reasons that they engage in self-harm behaviors. So the most prominent one is to manage distress. Um, think of it more like sort of a way to regulate emotion. So people doing it to um, relieve emotional pain. Um, some have done it up stress, anxiety, and um, self-harm to calm themselves down when the person is incredibly emotional upset. Um, it's also a way to get relief from a terrible state of mind um, or a way to sort of take the pain away from my heart and put it elsewhere. Again, you can see um, everyone's story is kind of unique, like they have different reasons, even though it's within this um, reason of managing um, distress. Another one is punishment, um, mostly self-punishment. Um, a person who self-harm thinks that they deserve punishment and hence they harm themselves. Um, the, the word numb also come into um, context. Um, the researchers put it into the dissociation um, field, but it it seems like um, there can be sort of two different um, sides of it as well. So a person one can be sort of self harming to stop themselves from feeling so that they can feel the numbness, um, but another person can be doing so in order to get themselves awake again because self harming can be awakening experience. Um, yeah, it's likewise for this one as well. Um, I feel numb physically, emotionally. I can feel my own skin after self-harming. I can physically feel again. My senses come back. I got a surge of energy and regain sensation. So even within the same sort of reason, um, the two different reasons as well. Um, another one, which is quite interesting, is to avert suicide. So a person harm themselves without a suicidal intention so that they can stop themselves from, from killing themselves. And um, there are many other more reasons that um, I am not presenting for this session. Um, so if you're interested um, to know more about it, feel free to go to this journal article. If you cannot find it, feel free to drop me an email after the session as well. I'm very happy to email them to you. So it, it seems like there are valid reasons um, to categorize 
um, or something like self-harm based on the suicidal or non-suicidal intention. So in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health or Mental Disorders, uh, so we'll called DSM in the fifth edition, um, they come up with these two new um, conditions for further study, recommended as conditions for further study. One is non-suicidal self-injury, which is something um, close to non-suicidal self-harm. The other one is suicidal behavior disorder, which is suicidal self-harm. Um, so you, you, I can see, we can see the intention of why, why they're trying to do so, because um, one is non-suicidal and one is suicidal, but there are pros and cons um, of, of doing so. And then a debate is actually still on, on, ongoing in the research field, whether it's appropriate, whether it's, it's, it's right to um, subdivide self-harm into the suicidal versus non-suicidal kind of um, um, distinction. So the, the pros would be, um, there will be standardized terminologies instead of having like a plethora of terminologies like I showed in my previous slides, um, then it will be easier for scientists, um, for, for health professionals to com communicate with each other using a standardized term so that they all of us, all of us, all of us, sorry, all of us know what we're talking about. Uh, and then this will be helpful for like um, designing treatment, treatment options. Um, and also for patients, um, having, having a mental health condition diagnosed um, can be helpful for them in, in, in claiming like social benefits, insurance and so on. And also avoid the risk of being diagnosed another mental health condition because some psychiatrists will think that um, their patient need to have um, because in order for, for a patient to, to have treatment you have to get a diagnosis and um, I have like from psychiatrists sometimes they have to give a diagnosis so that a patient that the thing requires diagnosis can uh, requires treatment can go into treatment so um, these are the pros of it um, but there are lots of cons as well. So the first one is it can be stigmatizing. Um, suicide is already quite um, a taboo in society and um, adding the term disorder behind it, is it going to sort of making the situation worse? Is it going to be more stigmatizing and how the society is going to view it? Um, and the term non-suicide here for, non for self-injuries can be also misleading because um, non because the best predictor for a suicide attempt is previous history of non-suicidal self-injury. So calling it non-suicidal um, seems to be not right for some. Um, so there's this um, psychiatrist or psychologist um, based in the UK called Navi Kapoor. He wrote a paper that sort of um, summarized all these pros and cons um, in the situation. So there are, so yes, DSM-5 came out with non-suicidal self-injury attempted suicide. Um, are this a valid new diagnosis or are they just a false dichotomy? Because think of it like a continuum of self-harm. Like on one end, you have a person who harmed themselves without suicidal intention. And at the other, at the other end, it's self-harm with suicidal intention. Then where do we draw the line or border? for this. Um, and the motivation um, of self-harm can be different from episodes to episodes or even within a single episode in very rare cases. So this is one of the interview study carried out by um, Navi Kapoor. So it, at first, the person was thinking about ending their life, um, but then start thinking about my grand and think my mom letting me down last day and so on. And, and the person ended up starting to take the pills in anger. And if you remember the non-suicidal reasons for self-harming, this seems more like um, in order to sort of regulate one's emotion, to manage the distress. And was it suicidal? Was it non-suicidal? And who are we to, to dictate that? Who are we to say that it's non-suicidal or suicidal? So, um, but again, because everyone's story is different, is unique. So this is only an anecdotal um, finding and um, I, I would suggest not to generalize 
this single um, description to everyone who self-harm. Another, um, so there are, there are different theories um, that explain why a person um, attempts suicide or die by suicide. So one of the most famous one is this by Joyner, Thomas Joyner. Um, so he, he proposed that in order for, for a person to attempt suicide, three things have to happen. So the first one is thwarted belongingness, um, i.e. feeling alone. So like exclusion from society, exclusion from social groups. Um, the second one is perceived burdensomeness, feeling oneself as a burden for friends, for families, which is often untrue, but um, it's being believed by a person. Um, and when these two things come together, um, it induces the desire for suicide. But these, these two are not enough for a person to attempt suicide yet. The third thing that, um, that come into play for tragedy to happen is capability for suicide. Think of it like um, we are afraid of pain. Um, we are afraid of death, generally. And, and generally, we want to avoid being in pain. But um, the, so, so capability for suicide is like the ability or the capability to, to go beyond that, to cross that barrier, to cross that threshold into harming oneself. So it's, it can, so it's, it's sometimes being described as a form of fearlessness towards pain or fearlessness towards death. And non suicidal self harm come into this context where when a, even if a person's harmed themselves without suicidal intention, um, that can increase the capability for, for suicide. Because um, as, you, as one person keeps harming themselves, um, a person is more used or getting habituated to, to higher and higher level of pain. And then that, that can increase the person's capability for suicide. And, and, and when it comes together with these two um, elements, then it will um, result in a suicide attempt. So my research is to see um, if there are different genetic factors that can, ex um, that can explain the difference between suicidal and non-suicidal self-harm. Um, so in my recently published paper, um, I, I used two methods to study, to, to answer this question, are there different genetic risk factors between suicidal and non-suicidal self-harm? So the first one is polygenic scoring, and I'm, I'm going to just talk about polygenic scoring for, for this sharing session. Um, so a polygenic score, think of it like a proxy of genetic propensity. It's kind of like a test score that you know, a person can get, and it's unique for everyone. So the higher the score, it means the higher the genetic propensity is. So um, how do I generate polygenic scores? So I need two things. The first thing is a study, a genetic study that has been done previously. We call it genome-wide association study or GWAS, and it provides me summary statistics about genetic effect for a particular condition. Say um, I have a GWAS study for, for depression, and I can know which genetic variant is um, being linked with depression from the GWAS. But having that's not enough. I, in order to generate polygenic scores, for people, I need people. Um, so here's the sample that I use. It's about 126,000 participants. Each of them has um, their DNA, and then you know I obtain DNA information from them, and then match it with the summary statistics from genetic effects, and I can generate polygenic scores for each of if each of these individuals and um, the apologetic scores will inform the genetic propensity for a particular condition. So I can generate apologetic score for depression, I can generate apologetic score for um, um, body weight, apologetic score for um, height, and so on. So just to note again, apologetic score is a proxy of genetic propensity. So it is more like sort of the, the propensity like the prop is more probabilistic rather than deterministic but just because you have a high polygenic score for um for for being tall it doesn't mean you're definitely going to be tall for example so i generated polygenic scores for 24 risk factors for self-harm um from different 
domains like mental health conditions, personality traits, BMI, education, attainment, substance use, and so on. And I asked two questions. The first one is, which polydrug scores are linked with self-harm? Uh, and the second one is, are there any differences in how these polydrug scores are linked with suicide and non-suicidal self-harm? Um, so out of these 24 polydrug scores, I found that mostly the polygenic scores that are linked with self-harm are polygenic scores for mental health conditions. So there are polygenic scores for depression, ADHD, schizophrenia, alcohol dependence disorder, lifetime cannabis use, and bipolar disorder. So how about when um, I consider the effect of all of these polygenic scores together in the same model? It turns out that the polygenic score for alcohol dependence disorder is not significantly linked with self-harm anymore. So become only these five mental health con um, policy scores for mental health con for these five mental conditions are still linked with self-harm. So again, I want to stress that genetic influence for complex human behavior, like especially self-harm, such a complex behavior is, it is probabilistic, but not deterministic. So it's only increasing the risk for self-harm. So having high genetic risk for, for each of these um, mental health condition doesn't mean you're definitely going to harm yourself. And the second question, which is probably more interesting, is are there any differences how these polygenic scores are linked with suicide and non-suicide self-harm? Um, so we didn't find any significant differences. So, um, so it's kind of like bringing, you know, suggesting that there's not much difference between these two different forms of self-harm, um, at least from the genetic perspective. And I want to be very careful in this and not to oversell um, this research because there are a list of limitations and we should be really, really careful in interpreting um, the results. So the most prominent one will be statistical power issue um, because each of the genetic variant contributing to mental health condition, um, because, it's, because mental health conditions are also polygenic so each of the genetic variants only contribute a very, very small effect size. Um, and the reason why there is no, and, and um, because there are many, because it's polygenic trait, there are many genetic factors. So it's only when they come together that you can see a, large, a larger effect size than each in individual genetic variant. So statistical power issue is definitely one of them. Pleiotropy, um, it means the genetic Make, uh, the genetic risk might not work through uh, the mental health condition pathway because one genetic variant can probably um, work in different ways. Like in, in one direction is like contributing towards higher risk in mental health condition and then it can also um, increase the risk for something else. And then that, that thing can in turn increase the risk for self-harm rather than through the mental health condition. Um, and then definitions of suicidal, non-suicidal self-harm, are they really valid definitions? Also representativeness of um, the UK Bell Bank sample. Um, so they are not representative of the general UK population because, um, so in terms of demography, in terms of age, um, they're not representative. And there are, there are also many other important risk factors that are not identified or included in this study because um, in order to generate polygenic scores, I need um, the GWAS study, and not all risk factors have GWAS. And again, small effect size. So, so all in all, polygenic score is not clinically ready for mental health conditions yet. Like, it's not ready in psychiatric field yet. So yeah, I guess the takeaway um, from this is coming back to um, this paper, the results from my um, study probably contributes, sort of like um, contribute to the debate and maybe um, these two different um, labels of diagnosis are probably a false dichotomy because self-harm is such a complex behavior again. And yes, it was a, a good attempt to try to sort of see if there are differences, but um, from the genetic perspective, in terms of underlying genetic risk, even though there are two different outcomes, they seem to have similar underlying genetic risk. So, and also from, from this joiners theory, um, I also noticed that it's, it's really important for us to care for each other. Um, 
because it's, it's, it's possible to remove any of these risk factors that contribute um, um, to, to, to a suicide attempt. You know, if, if you notice a friend who's always alone or, or a friend who wants to talk to you about feeling lonely, providing social support um, can, can help one from feeling, um, from feeling the loneliness. And also perhaps telling people how amazing they are and how important they are in our lives can help, to, can help them not to, to know that they are not a burden to others. And finally, knowing or identifying friends who are self-harming, even though it's for non-suicidal reason, is also important as well, because um, that can contribute towards um, increasing the capability to harm oneself more severely. So, um, so helping, helping friends, helping people who you know, or even strangers by signposting them to professionals, to appropriate mental health support is really important um, to stop the tragedy from happening. Okay, um, so that's the part about my research. And I realized that I might have spent too much time talking about it. So um, I know it was a heavy topic and it's really hard to imagine a pain when one has to experience in self-harming both physically and mentally. Um, so I'm trying to end this sharing session with a slightly more cheerful tone by sharing about my day, daily life as a PhD student. So um, my work is mostly coding, computational work, or statistical analysis, because um, I'm working with genetic data, um, and also um, um, mental health questionnaire, like data points from, from mental health questionnaires. So my workplace is pretty flexible as long as I have access to internet, I have access to data um, and a decent laptop to work on. So I can work from home, I can work from my office, or sometimes I work in library or cafe as well. Um, there will be weekly meetings with my supervisors. Um, and another academic activity that I would do kind of more religiously is attending seminars and talks. Um, so. Speaking of seminars and talks, um, my center has this weekly seminar that I find really attractive. Um, so every week there will be um, a person or, or even multiple speakers sharing about their research. They can be the head of department, the professors, um, postdocs, or even PhD students um, in the center or, or even invited speakers from outside. Um, and it's something that I really enjoy going to. Um, this is a view from my office window. Um, so I'm sort of sitting facing this window. So I, um, and because I'm based in London, London's weather is somehow very gloomy. So um, I got inspiration from watching Frozen from this um, Disney character called Olaf. So I put on his photos so that he can remind me to be more optimistic and be hopeful, at least to the weather. Um, so yeah, and here's a picture that only happens like once in a while. I guess it's probably going to happen only once in my entire PhD when there's good weather um, and um, we have like invited speaker and then after her talk, um, we want to talk more about her research and then we decided to sort of lay out um, um, picnic mats outside since it's nice weather and we're not and then continue talking about her research. Um, it does look like a bed of roses, but PhD life is definitely not a bed of roses. Sometimes it can be quite um, overwhelming as well, waiting for the models to, to converge. Um, and working from home during the lockdown can also add to the restlessness. Um, so just to put it out there to remind anyone who is interested in doing PhD to, to know that there are also challenges in doing a PhD. So um, last but not least, I want to give an acknowledgement to my supervisors. So I'm kind of like a hybrid because I have two supervisors, one from each university. Um, so this is my group from King's College London, and this is my group from UCL. Um, this is my primary supervisor who helps me a lot in um, twin modeling. And, and this is my secondary supervisor from UCL. Um, who helps me a lot in um, um, the more molecular genetics part. And here are two of my lab groups, PhD students, postdocs, 
were really helpful. Um, I wouldn't survive my PhD till now without them. Yep, um, so that's all for my sharing session today. Sorry if it drags a bit too long. Um, so feel free to connect with me on Twitter, email, LinkedIn. And thank you. Thank you for Embias for organizing this as well. Thanks. So I think um, before we move into like the, re the general self-harm bit, I think a few people would like to know, one, what are your highlights and struggles of your journey so far, your academic journey so far? Really? Yeah, that's, I can't really, well, you know, at different times I probably give out different answers, but like right now, what I can think of it is frustration when you don't know something, like you don't know how to do something correctly and then not sure if I'm doing things in the right way. Um, and and um, as I presented before, like there's this debate whether we should use self-harm as the terminology to, to, to as an umbrella term or like, you know, distinguishing between this, um, using a suicidal intent as like kind of like a dimension. So mm. that's one of the greatest frustration I have, at least in this week, in preparing <laughs> for this talk and also like thinking about my research. Because mm. you want to make sure like everything is given like factually correct as well, because it's such a sensitive topic. Mm. You want, and so often we see signs like getting twisted by the media in a way that suits them best politically. So yeah, I think it's a fine line. Um, highlights though. What highlights? Oh, yeah. about that. Um, I guess like going to conferences, attending talks, listening to really exciting research, um, meeting other researchers from different institutions and knowing that maybe somehow they're doing something similar to what I'm doing and then yeah. still find a friend. Um, yeah. And like, yeah, discussing about science with them. That, yeah. that was my highlight, like the yeah. intellectual stimulation. Yeah, I get what you mean because like I always feel like my work doesn't mean anything after you've been doing it for too long but then you go to a conference and you hear people talk about their work and then you're suddenly like oh wow actually you, you kind of like relight your motivation to do stuff mm -hmm. um, okay a second really general question psychology research what is it exactly I think people imagine psychology as like theories a lot of theories and like mind mm -hmm. stuff but mm -hmm. people don't realize the amount of bioinformatics and coding and stats that I've seen you guys do. So what exactly is psychology research? Yeah, um, <laughs> I guess consulting a psychology textbook for a proper definition would be uh, more helpful. But like something that comes from my mind is like psychology is a study of human mind. And in studying about human mind and human behavior, we can use different methods. Some people, um, you know, come come from more kind of biological background, then they start to sort of um, study psychology, as i.e., human mind, human behavior. Um, yeah, using using more sort of biological um, methods. Um, yeah, um, some 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 may prefer to sort of use questionnaires and then use a lot of statistical methods to analyze psychological um, data. And there is a trend in psychology nowadays to start using coding software rather than mm. SPSS. Um, I know that the university I went previously, UCL, they're starting to teach statistics using R, which is um, a statistical software that I'm using for most of my research as well. Okay. So, yeah, that's a really good question. Okay. So heads up to anyone out there who's like, I want to go study, I want to study psychology in uni, or I want to take up a psychology PhD, what does it really mean? Mm -hmm. um, hopefully Kai Xiang answered that question. If not, I think Kai Xiang will be quite open to you chatting with him afterwards on social media, whatnot, to get more insight. But following on that, how do you avoid psychology student syndrome, i.e. overdiagnosing yourself by being aware of terminologies? Yeah, that's a good question as well. Do you do that? Of course. Um... <laughs> Yeah, but I guess you can see it in a positive light. Um, like, um, so because you, you learn psychology, you know about psychology, you're more aware of your mental health, mm. then you put in more time to, to care about yourself, to care about your mental health. Um, so rather than sort of being worried about, oh, am I, am I getting depression? Am I getting anxiety disorder? Um, maybe seeing a po more positive light, like what, how can I um, 
safeguard my mental health? How can mm. I care for my mental health? Mm. Yeah. And also, I guess there's a fine line of caring just enough or caring too much that becomes negative. Which is yes, exactly yeah, what exactly. you said. Yeah. Okay, um, circling back to your research, I think when you were saying, and someone asked, so what is the ultimate aim or impact of your research? Does it mean in the future you can reliably predict the propensity for someone to experience a mental health disorder based on genetics? And what would you do with that info? Mm. Yeah, that, that's a question being asked for a lot of um, researchers in psychiatry genomics as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but so far, um, um, polygenic score, like all, all these um, different methods are not ready to be used clinically yet. Mm-hmm. Yes, there, there are some people who are quite ambitious in, um, so we talk about personalized medicine, precision medicine, um, so that it's helpful to sort of identify people who are at higher risk. But so far, for, for mental health conditions, I think environmental risks are more helpful in helping yeah. you to sort of identify people at higher risk. Um, so now the, the narrative sort of shift from personalized medicine to stratified medicine. So identifying subgroups of people who are at higher risk, higher genetic risk for certain mental health conditions. Um, and we, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but it seems like, um, you know, with the genomics revolution and so on, every day there are like new genetic studies, the, the jewels that I mentioned in my slides just now coming out and then more and more genetic variants are identified. Um, of course, with, there are people who are like, mm, there are some limitations of the studies as well. Like you're not sure if these genetic risks are really the genetic variants. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, but um, for, for my own personal research for my PhD, I'm trying to sort of see whether the DSM-5 criteria or the idea, so these suggestions for future research mm-hmm. for, for two new diagnoses, whether they are really helpful or not. So mm-hmm. at least from this genetic perspective, it seems like, you know, it's, it's probably better to use self-harm to rather than sort of trying to um, be more specific because it's really hard to, to see the difference. Okay. Mm. okay. Um, next question. Can non-suicidal self-harm be positive? In this sense, positive meaning leading to an outcome of growth and understanding or to alleviate certain stress? Hmm. Um, there, in, the, in the systematic review, this is a really good question. In the systematic review um, there are, of the qualitative studies, um, there are people who self-harm report that like having self-harm helped them to feel a bit more positive, like positive in the sense that, you know, a sense of relief. Mm-hmm. Um, but we also see how, how it can be risky in terms of mm-hmm. increasing the capability for, for suicide. So, um, Are there any papers addressing this crossroad why some people go, like take a U-turn back to like positive, but some continue in the mm-hmm. direction of possibility committing suicide? Mm-hmm. I'm not aware of a paper that that's about that, but like there are papers about self harm cessation, like how how a person transformed from self harming to stop self harming, because um, somehow sometimes it can be a bit um, it becomes an, an urge to harm yourself, and and you mm-hmm. cannot you 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 know you probably know it is not good for you, but mm. you want you feel the urge mm. of doing that, mm. so there. Are, there are papers about self-harm cessation. That's just what I have um, encountered so far. Okay. Mm. I guess, like, looking at that Venn diagram again, I guess maybe one of the factors is really just removing, like, and that mental health jargon, like, remo- removing a lot of the environmental risk factor probably plays a big part, I don't know, in helping them decide which path they ultimately end up on, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Right. Do you personally think that there should be another definition or characterization for self-harming? Mm, this is a really good question. I always ask myself this question as well. Like, um, seems what is like the current definition of self-harming? It is the one in NICE guideline. Um, so at least in the UK, mm-hmm. um, in NICE guideline, it is an have self injury or self-poisoning regardless of motivation. Or intention, but in the US, 
sometimes when I read the research paper, mm -hmm. self-harm can be seen as um, more than also suicidal dimension. Um, yeah, there are evidence to say that maybe it's not a really good idea to sort of try to um, separate them into two different dimensions. But I listen, so I remember this experience because I was sort of being convinced by that already somehow during my mm. day. <laughs> um, and then I was listening to a podcast about self-harm and then there was a person who had history of self-harming. Um, she, she urged the researchers to really look into this, like, you know, Sometimes when we self-harm, we don't want to, we're we not thinking about suicide at all, but why do you keep asking this question about, do you want to yeah. be alive and so on? So um, that's sort of bringing to the other side of the debate. Yeah, so I guess... It, it's a very personal question, because that question, that statement can mean a lot of different things to different people. Mm. And I, I guess it cut the general guidelines now, just came from the general population so yeah. I guess maybe like some of the sideline people who doesn't feel the same would feel a bit like, oh, that doesn't apply to me because I'm not like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a difficult, difficult one. Mm -hmm. Do you personally think that there are different magnitudes of self-harming? Oh, you mean like in terms of severity? That is definitely, yeah, there, there are many evidence to show. I mean, it's, it's, it's there, like that there is like sort of less severe non fatal type of self-harming mm -hmm. and then there's a more severe type of self-harming and, and there are different methods as well. Um yeah, I mm. I I I'm not I mean. comfortable to give like examples. Yeah. Um yeah, but um and, and the severity can be a predictor for, for future suicide attempts as well. So the severe yeah. it is, um the more predictive it is for future mm -hmm. that attempt. Okay. Mm. Is hair pulling, um, the official term is trichotillomania. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that right, but it basically means pulling out your own hair, um, a form of self injury. Um, let's change self injury to self harm because that's a term. Oh, self harm, yeah, okay. Yes. I use in this, um, um, in this sharing session. It depends on which definition you're relying on. So <laughs> if it is like using a nice guideline, so is any form of self-harming or self-poisoning, regardless of motivation, then yes, yes. like mm -hmm. a, a mm -hmm. form of self-harm. But if you're mm -hmm. using a DSM-5 criteria for, you know, the suggestions for future studies, the non-suicidal self-injury, it has a really clear definition. Mm. Um, and one of them is like, this, this, this um, diagnosis cannot be explained by, by any other mental health diagnosis so the hair pulling mm -hmm. disorder is one of the um, mm. diagnosis in DSM so in that sense it will not be considered as a non-suicidal self-injury okay so basically how likely are the influence of friends around them and causing self-harm on themselves I think is the question yeah one one of the risk factors for self-harm is knowing someone someone who self-harm so I guess mm. that yeah so yeah, and, and I guess we also heard, heard like terms about like copycat suicide. Mm -mm. So, um, yeah, I guess it's being exposed to that. And then, um, what's yeah. the motivation behind that then? Because I would assume, mm. do they do it because they are suffering from the same background, like their friends who are self harming might be, or are they just doing it? for copy, copying sake? Mm. Mm. I'm not too sure about this. I'm not really well mm. read well into this mm -hmm. area. Um, but if you look look back at Joyner's theory and also, because I, 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 um, I read one of his books recently, mm. he proposed that it's really hard for one person to, to harm themselves unless, you know, you, you've- There's a reason to. to do so. so um, yeah, it's, um, what was the question again? Was it because oh, yeah. of underlying? So yeah, it because of copying. Um, so um, is it like a trigger, maybe? And then yeah, like... yeah, yeah. It might be a trigger, and also because I don't have any research papers to back myself up. Like this mm, is mm, mm, mm. yeah. Um, it's probably because of underlying um conditions, like like 
psychological or mental health conditions mm. um, that yeah like like and also the non-societal reasons for self-harm that presented just like to manage the stress mm. um, and so on so when you see an example like like someone who's doing that maybe you would think that oh it might be a good way to um, manage my distress mm. so, okay yeah. How, i understand this is probably not your professional area but mm. personal opinion how can you help a friend who is self-harming mm. yeah because i i don't have any sort of clinical training um, yeah Although I wish I do, um, I guess like um, like signposting your friends to like mental health professionals, encouraging them to seek for help, encouraging them to um, yeah seek for help, like like to 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 see someone who is working on, mm. on help that would be very helpful for them. Mm. And um, um, in Malaysia, there is. Um, this hotline calls um, Befriend Befrienders. Befrienders, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, it, it will be good to sell signposts and to, to talk to um, the help, the hotline and then, you know, just talk about that. Just yeah. some, sometimes even talking about them help and um, and if your friend chooses to talk, to share with you about mm. really personal issue, um, like, do, practice active listening you know, be non-judgmental mm. um be open-minded mm. um and and just focus rather than making that conversation focus on yourself like trying to focus the conversation mm. on your friend so mm. um like like there's this term called active listening um and how to be a good listener like if you google you, you can find um tips on how to be mm. a good listener mm. Okay, we have four more questions in the general session, so hopefully five minutes we can finish them. Um, so, sex, next one is, um, do the different kinds of self-harm behaviour have different motivations or psychological factors behind them? So, different kind of self-harm behaviours as in different methods or...? Um... I'm assuming different kinds of self-harm behaviour. I assume maybe different methods of self-harm. Mm. Okay. So if it's like different methods of self-harm, um, remember that a person can experience multiple episodes of self-harming and then the methods can change from time to time. And I guess because self-harm is complex, so the, the reasons, the underlying reasons are multifactorial as well. So it, mm. there is never just one reason for self-harm, for mm. like, you know, one reason for mm. entire population to self-harm. Mm. There will be like, different reasons fitting into it mm. and then um yeah so so i would say it, it will be quite so complex rather than so a systematic way like because of reason a then you choose method a mm. Mm. okay um next is what are your opinions regarding rage room businesses as stress management so rage room is basically a business where people can vent their rage by destroying objects within a room i think we've seen that in singapore where they mm. give you like an axe and then a room and then you can go around and smash stuff. Mm. Yeah, in a way, it seems like a, a way to sort of um, release, release your, yeah. um, 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 distress. Yeah. Um, I guess it's more like temporary relief instead of, it's like putting a band-aid on a, on a cut, but not like actually finding out what caused the wound in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, like, yeah, you know, just like, um, you know, like everyone has their own sort of opinion about this. Um, I guess we need research to to tell us more about this. Like, um, mm. I don't because it's like this rich room is also <laughs> quite new, so I'm not mm. sure what I've done um, research about. It. And then mm. it can be perceived in different cultural contexts, mm. like how this being seen in the West can be different how it's being perceived in the East, um, mm. and also others of social demographic factors as well. True. True. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a very fine line beside, between suicidal and non-suicidal. Okay, I guess this question, so this was basically asking whether you can correctly categorize these two things, non-suicidal and suicidal self-harm, to make sure that you had two distinct groups for your ana analysis. Mm. Yeah, was the question how? Or? 
Yeah, how did you, yeah, how? Yeah, um, because I work on pre-collected data. Um, so the, the questionnaire is already given to the participants, the answer, and then with the data collected and then given to me. Um, so how the question was asked, is a sort of flaw as well. Um, so the, the, the participants were asked the first question, in your lifetime, have you ever harmed yourself? Mm. Um, whether or not it was, you know, the intention of dying, and you can mm. answer yes or no. And you answer yes, you're asked of like a follow-up question. So was it, mm. you know, with the intention of dying? Mm. Um, one flaw I can see from this question is that a person can have multiple episodes of self-harm. Yeah. Sometimes with suicidal intention. Yeah. Sometimes we doubt. Yeah. And the way the questions are sort of like a, a false that could like yes them. or no, yeah. Yeah, yeah but I guess your your paper also kind of showed that that isn't really a very distinct. You can't really dis categorize these two into one mm. or the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, last general question. Is there any research on why cannabis use polygenic score um score is linked to self-harm while the score for alcohol dependency is not? Mm. Um, I think there was like a new research coming out, um, like a few days ago showing that cannabis use, alcohol dependence and smoking, um, can, can sort of like lead to self-harm. But again, um, like the, oh yeah, I forgot to, to stress this in my sharing just now. So just because the relationship is it's not there it doesn't mean it's not there it can be because of low statistical power issue so maybe there is there is a link between cannabis use the, the genetic the genetic risk of cannabis use with self-harm um, but because of the statistical power issue so it's not shown in the research mm -hmm. so my research is only a beginning sorry mm -hmm. it's not the end it's only a beginning yeah so um it has to be replicated it has to be done in different um samples mm -hmm. um, in order to sort of reach like a concrete um, conclusion. Okay. Circling back to your specific study, do mm. you know the diversity of your genetic samples? Did gen gender, race, social, economic background have a different viewpoint? Yes, very good question. Um, so this is a UK, um, UK based um, sample. Mm. Um, they are mostly white. Um, and I I, and because of ancestry um, and this issue called population stratification, um, there will be different um, linkage. This like, this like kind of how should I describe this? So, um, because previous geoses are done on uh, mostly white European samples, so it will be most predictive for people of white European ancestry as well. So I had to um, only use. Um, white British sample in my in my analysis to avoid um, the population stratification problem. Um, but in general, UK biobank sample is older than the general population. They are they are more sort of in the middle age um, spectrum. They are also generally more well off, so higher social economic status, so not not representative of the UK population. So and also mostly white British, so not representative of the racial um, demographics as well. Okay. Um, okay, so moving on to technical. Are there any hereditary effects of suicidal self-harm and non-suicidal self-harm? Is it passed down? Mm, okay, um, so in, in estimating heritability, so uh, let's define heritability first. Um, the cost definition would be the proportion of individual differences in the population explained by genetic factors. So it, it has to be seen a more kind of like a population or a sample kind of a lot of people kind of perspective where there are a lot of people and then they are different from one another. And what is causing these differences? Um, to what extent genetic um, factors are, are contributing to these differences? So, so it's different from how we think of like, oh yeah, my 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 heart is probably eighty percent genetic and twenty percent environment. Like, that's that's not what the research papers are showing. Okay. Um. So in terms of suicidal self harm, non suicidal self harm, um, we 
we usually use twin studies to estimate heritability, mm. um, but because they are twins, so they it, it again can be hard to sort of generalize to general population. But again, twins generally um, develop just like you and me who are not twins. Um, so that also lends some sort of support for twin studies. Um, from previous research, mostly in you know, Western countries, um, genetic factors can contribute as high as 50% to the individual differences. Mm -hmm. But um, remember that is is because self-harm is complex. Um, so for, for suicidal self, there are more, more studies, more twin studies on suicidal self-harm, like which is suicide attempt. Um, so most mostly it's like 50%. But remember this, um, there's these statistics that um, 90% of people who die from uh, who die because of suicide mm -hmm. have a diagnosis for psychiatric disorder. Mm. But also quite paradoxically, most of the people with mental health diagnosis never um, attempt suicide. So please don't generalize. Mm. Yeah. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that all this of, you know, 50% seems very high, but this can be because of the underlying genetic risk for mental health conditions. Okay, so building on that, when you say, okay, looking at the general population and then identifying those who self-harm and mm -hmm. then looking if there are genetic variants causing them to maybe self-harm, mm. how do you know that the genetic variants are the causing factor mm -hmm. and not just happens to be associate, associations and confounders? Especially because mm -hmm. when you mentioned about twin studies as well, so very similar genetics growing up in a disadvantage and a versus an advantage background. Like I think there's been a lot of studies that have shown like the background is what really matters ultimately and it's, like has more influence um, mm -hmm. in that sense. So how do you know that the genetic variants that researchers are looking for are mm -hmm. causing it and not just, mm -hmm. just happens to be associated? And maybe are you targeting the wrong bit? Mm -hmm. Look Very good question. I forgot to point out that when you are estimating heritability using twin study, mm. you don't take that genetic sample. So you, that's because twins, um, we have two types of twins, so the identical twins mm. and non identical twins. So identical twins, in average, share 100% of their genetic um, variation, and then non identical twins share like 50%. And then what we do is using um, statistical methods to to analyze um, the how these twins are related to each other and mm -hmm. also how they're different from each other and then from there um, because so it's a bit like solving um, what is that equation called like you know we have x and y and you're giving two equations and they can solve the value yeah 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 yeah. Oh my gosh, I forgot what is that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's a bit in, in that sort of um, idea, or like this sort of situation that um, you know monozygotic twins are hundred percent genetically correlated, uh, identical, and then these are twins under not identical, mm -hmm. not identical mm -hmm. twins are fifty percent. And then based on that, you can derive to what extent genetic factors are playing a role in their individual differences. Okay. And, and um, so by individual differences, I mean variance. If there are people who are um, familiar with statistics here, so essentially it's just explain. It's just of decomposing the variance into genetic factors, genetic influence, and then because twins can grow up in identical or similar environment that make them more similar, that is called shared environment, mm -hmm. and then. A pair of twins can also experience different environmental factors that's called non-shared environment. So mm -hmm. when I look into non uh, the environmental part, I can further decompose um, the variance into shared environment and non-shared environment. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, I think I haven't really explained um, uh, answered the question yet. Like um, so for suicidal <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. 50 yeah. percent for non-suicidal self-harm very little study has been done yet and um part of my phd i'm doing it yeah but it seems like um from, from my sort of early result it seems like they are also quite genetically correlated um so imagine i'm using twins twin data for for one research and then 
and then the, the one that presented in this sharing, which is using general you know, population. Yeah, general population. I found like similar um, results so far, like sort of pointing towards the similar um, um, yeah, interpretation. Okay. Mm. Okay. I think the, the question is to what extent the polygenic score for depression is linked with self-harm because that's what I did in my research. Um, okay. so among the six um, polygenic scores that are identified in, in, in um, you know, out of the 24 risk factors, um, the polygenic score for depression is the one that is with the largest effect size. Um, but um, there is a caveat there because in in order for someone to to so so if you look at the diagnostic criteria for for depression in DSM five, one of the diagnostic criteria is suicidality, so it might become like a tautology already. Um, the polygenic score for um, depression is pro probably also capturing the the genetic risk for self harming. Mm, uh, okay. So in in the subsequent MR analysis, it sort of suggests that. That thing as well because um, when this happens we call it pleiotropy mm. um, which means it's not going through the depression pathway it's going through a different pathway mm. um, from the genetic variant to self-harm so that is being shown in the MR analysis okay mm. um, how does polygenic risk scores for mental illnesses compare to that of physical illnesses like cancer if it's in terms of like the the effect size or like how how well it's predicting um so apology score for like cancer coronary heart disease and so on is doing much much better than apology score for mental health conditions so um i guess it makes sense as well because um even for diagnosis um it's really hard for psychiatrists sometimes to to to, to come up with a proper diagnosis and sometimes misdiagnosis happens as well so in genetic sense, that means the phenotype is not well defined when you're conducting mm -hmm, genetic mm -hmm. analysis. Box. Um, next week we have Stanley who is doing his his PhD on volcanoes. So a very different, a very different topic from what we're used to. So it would be very interesting. So do tune in and more updates regarding future research inside the series, like our Facebook page um, from MBIOS and Hundred SOM. And we will see you next Saturday. Right. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Bye.